Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice. Through interviews, discussions, and music, your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your hosts, Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. This is our first ever bonus episode, coming to you outside of our regular publication schedule, and as an extended conversation that's longer than our normal episodes. I'm joined by Dr. Timothy McDonnell, the head of the Sacred Music Area and Director of Choral Studies at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. We hope you'll find this episode extremely helpful in looking at how, especially at this time, you might develop your skills as a conductor, as a vocal pedagogue, and even your ear training skills, all those things necessary for parish music directors. We'll discuss a class Tim is offering online this summer through St. Joseph's Seminary that's designed specifically for that purpose. But we also look at the issues on the hearts and minds of so many right now. What do we do in this time? How can we approach it spiritually? What does this mean for our music programs? Tim and I discuss, especially in the second half of the episode, ideas for music directors in the near-term future of music making in the church. Thanks so much for joining me today, Tim. Happy to be with you. Thanks for having me. So most church musicians work with all or mostly amateur voices, and this presents unique challenges. In your experience, what are some of the most challenging things about working with amateur singers? And what tips might you give to someone to overcome those challenges, possibly even seeing them as opportunities? Well, let me start with the opportunities first. I think that there are certain advantages that amateur voices bring to the music making experience that are perhaps, you know, special compared to when you work exclusively with professional singers in a choral setting, for instance. For example, in a choral setting in which I'm working with professionals, there's a real strong tendency for the professionals to sing really only in one style. So I personally have had a hard time sometimes working with professional singers inhabiting the chant style for the Gregorian chant style, for instance. There tends to be almost too much tone being used, and they don't sacrifice that tone for the shape of the phrase and for the the delicateness of the linear kind of music that you're dealing with. It's beautiful in its own way, but it's kind of a flat performance frequently. And so I often, you know what I'm talking about with that? I often refer to it as a sort of bulldozer sound. (laughs) Yeah. There's no softness in the tone. That's right. And every note is treated like a note in Palestrina, which has a kind of solidity to it for the polyphonic contrapuntal structure. It's very different with chant. And I think that just in the way that professional singers can be coached into maybe not doing that as much, amateur singers bring a kind of stylistic flexibility that I think is really, really important and something that that I think is an advantage. In talking about challenges that we often encounter with with amateur voices i think first of all you as a choir director there'll be issues of from my point of view intonation is probably the biggest challenge more often than not i believe that intonation is more a function of how we use the voice and so a lot of voices that have a hard time tuning don't necessarily have a hard time hearing that they're out of tune. And I think that's those are two very different things. The, the acuity of your ear and the ability of your voice to do what your ear is asking are two very, very different things. And I think a lot of those are age-related issues. But on the basic level, where is the core tone in the voice of the amateur singer? It, it's different in every amateur voice. It's not the way it is in a trained singer where, where placement is a very specific thing that you work on for years and years. And so what choir directors, I think, have to do is, you know, they need to work on finding the tone placement for each of those voices, because until that core of your sound as a singer is in a reliable place where it can more or less say stable through a good range of notes tuning can be difficult. And that's something that can be coached. It's not something that directors should give up on to say, well, the voice is the way it is. There's a measure, there's a limited amount of time we have to work with our singers. But I think, for instance, trying to to remove inhibitions about singing maybe two at a time, start with that if people aren't comfortable singing one at a time, and just say, okay, let's try to get inside each other's sound. So let's start. And especially if you have 
someone who is really comfortable singing by themselves, have that individual start and ask individual voices to blend into that one person's voice so that they start to feel where to place their tone in relation to somebody else. Sometimes it's your voice if you're the choir director. You have to be the confident voice in which everybody else places their tone. So I think taking a little bit of time to do that it really pays dividends on the reliability of the sound of your chorus and their ability to to control pitch, especially, and to, to even do it with some nuance. Um, I've seen many voices develop, and it starts with this idea of finding your core tone. You know, that's a really interesting idea of having the pairing down of voices to find that core tone, because it's often a process that I see, you know, for example, in the New York area, we have a lot of one to a part or maybe two to a part singing. And it's a completely different phenomenon than uh, singing in a choir, in a university choir or something. And it's it's a real skill that has to be developed. And, you know, I, I know a lot of music directors, if they do have money for a program and they're hiring professional singers, sometimes they have a hard time helping even professional singers go into that sort of genre of one or two to a part singing. And it's it's a real challenge even for, you know, people who are going through conservatory for a music degree. One of the things that I emphasize in my the university part of my life with student singers is that if you want to be a professional singer in 2020 going and going forward, you have to really have a lot of vocal flexibility and you need to learn what your voice can do. That is to say, you don't sing Gregorian chant the way you sing Handel or Palestrina. Um, and you don't really sing Palestrina the way you sing Gregorian chant. So you have to learn the full capabilities of your voice if you're going to be a professional singer these days. And I, I've really been impressed by what students can do when they think about that. And, and a lot of times with my own programming with student musicians who are planning to be professionals, I will blend Reinberger with Poulenc and, and say, look, this is a totally different sound. I mean, I'll even do exercises where I'll, you know, do some basically singing on a chord for a period of time, count singing on an A flat major chord, and everybody has one note in the chord. And we count from one to seven as a dynamic range. And I'll say, okay, now let's go from one to five and let's use minimum vibrato. Let's go to one to eight where you're going to use a little bit more vibrato. But I want them to be thinking about the different colors in their voices and the, their capacity to access those different colors because that's what being a professional means. And especially in a context like you're describing, church music is the most diverse kind of repertoire there is because it is the oldest repertoire there is. And so I believe that all of those legitimate forms and styles of past ages are something we should embrace and perform. But that means we need to have an eye on, on flexibility. Right. So another sort of category of voices that parish music directors work with are aging voices. And so what are some of the helpful vocal technique tips you might give to someone to maintain or even try to improve their vocal quality as they age? And further, what might you say to directors who are younger about how they might encourage and work with aging voices? Sure. Yes. I think that, you know, I had some of this experience working with um, an older population as a choir director when I was younger. So I do know a bit about what that takes. And one of the things that happens just physically with the aging of the voice is that all of those cartilaginous tissues that make up the vocal tract become a little harder over time and they start to ossify. And one of the things that that leads to is a kind of brittleness or a lack of flexibility in the voice. So that's really physically what you're facing when you face the aging of the voice. At the same time, you also have to think about the weight of the voice, the natural weight of the voice. So if you are a dramatic soprano, for instance, that's your real natural voice. It's where your voice naturally sets itself. That is going to lead to certain complications as you get older. The heavier your voice, the more that there is a, a likelihood that you're going to have less flexibility as you get older. I've had people in their 80s who are light sopranos, light tenors, really maintain extremely youthful sound all the way. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular 
chorister who was 83 and she could sing any high notes that I asked her to do. And she was, she had really good basis for her own technique, good breath control and a certain lightness in the voice anyway, that allowed her to maintain a real high level of flexibility. If on the other hand, you're already experiencing a certain amount of ossification and you, you've already got difficulty managing the voice, especially in the higher range. There are two things to consider. First of all, the higher range may not be accessible after a certain point in your particular voice. Perhaps reassignment. I certainly have felt my own voice over the years move to different comfort zones in the, in the vocal ranges. So that would be one thing to say that, well, I'm a soprano. I may be a soprano today as a 24-year-old, but even by the time I'm 35, I could be a completely different voice as the voice ages, especially for women's voices, which age at a, at a slower rate in many cases. So I would say that a certain amount of self-knowledge is important there. There are some actual techniques that, that help to build a little bit of flexibility. Interestingly, I had a lot of success with singing staccato passages that were linear instead of words, not singing triads, but singing on scale degrees one, two, three, three, two, one, forward and backward on a light staccato, but not terribly high. That I found increased the flexibility of the voice. And so if we were doing something like Handel's Messiah, exercises like that before singing kind of coloratura passage work really improved the tone of some of the older voices that I was working with. I did some triad warm-ups, but I made sure not to go above, let's say, you know, E5 or something like that would be the highest I would go with any kind of a staccato work in a sort of general population. Another thing is that there are straw techniques. In other words, singing through a, like a coffee stir straw. There are techniques that will um, focus the voice and increase the control factor, which is what starts to go as the voice ages and, and some of those tissues harden. I've seen some real success in using a straw where you kind of are humming, but with a straw in your mouth and so that the air is escaping through the straw, but you can feel because there's resistance since the hole is very small, you can feel a better placement for your support. And the idea is that, okay, let me maintain that feeling when I take the straw away. And I've noticed in older voices that that technique tends to build pitch acuity and a certain amount of vocal flexibility. So those are a couple of strategies that I've seen. And you can see certain demonstrations on YouTube, for example, of this straw at practicing. It's not extreme. It's, it's, it's always moving from the middle of your voice outward, which I would also encourage as an important and healthy way to work the voice. So you don't start high. You start in the middle. You don't start too low either. You start in the middle and work out from there. The middle of your voice pretty much tells you what you are in terms of your voice classification. And again, that will change over time. All you need to do is listen to broadcasters over their careers and their voices tend to darken, tend to go lower. Let's say a parish music director has some time and the opportunity for growth as a conductor. What would you say to the music director that's never formally or intensively studied conducting? What are some basic skills they should focus on developing and how might they develop in that way? And and perhaps also, what might you say to the more skilled or experienced conductor um, who's a parish musician? I think one of the things that happens when we're working in the parishes is that we are conducting, approach to conducting, our conducting technique, if we have one, or even if we've just sort of picked it up on our own, it's, it's really not that hard to kind of figure out what the basics of it are. But we tend to become the victims of our own circumstances. And, you know, um, you're the accompanist and you're maybe an alto at the same time in the choir and you're the conductor. All those things, is, you have to be all of those things at the same moment in a, in a particular context. And so you can only do so many things really, really well, you know, under the circumstances. And so I think a lot of times we're compromised just by the natural challenges that we encounter in community music making, which is the lion's share of what church music is for us, in the Catholic Church especially, where we rely on the goodwill and volunteerism of our communities, but that, that volunteerism doesn't always provide tenors and altos or, or whatever the case may be. And so we're always filling in the blanks. And so conducting can sometimes be the last thing that we're worried about in our choir lofts and our music performance situations. So the first thing that I would say is that 
every choir, any, or actually any kind of ensemble, because a lot of us are working even one on a part, even among avocational singers, you don't have all the voice parts in, in multiple dimensions. So you may have one on a part anyway. One of the things that I think we really need to do in every situation is to get a, a certain measure of unaccompanied singing built into our routine, even if it's only in the warm up. And I do a couple of things in the warm up. I think it's really important to warm up the voice, again, starting from the middle to the extremes without going into places which may be injurious to your group, but starting in the middle to the extreme. So the voice needs to be warmed up. But I really firmly believe that warming up our ears and warming up the ensemble as an organism is really important. And the best way to do that is unaccompanied singing, which then gives you an opportunity to use gesture to help your choir, not just to stay together, but to give them information about the quality that they're giving you, and then you give them immediate feedback. And so conducting uh, includes both time and quality. So you're showing quality and time at the same time that you're conducting and doing a warm up on a triad, for example, where you're showing a crescendo from, let's say, on a scale of one to 10, you're going to go from one to five. And you do this with your gesture. The gesture helps them to be together, helps them to sing soft and in a supported way. So if you're if you're conducting in such a way that your your hands are really high, that may not be conducive to a really good, well solidified low breath that's going to ho help them to, to produce a very quiet sound, incidentally. So the gesture does matter. Okay, so if you're coming from a point of view where you don't have any gesture in your musical training, in your musical background, you haven't done conducting. I think the very first thing to do is to begin to master the standard conducting patterns. I have a lot of nuance that I would bring to those patterns in my teaching of conducting, but the very first place to start is showing time. And that's what those patterns are particularly well designed to do. And conducting involves showing things in a very effective way. And so you'd be surprised at how little tiny adjustments in where your elbow, for instance, is, how that actually can affect the sound of the group. So I don't want to oversimplify conducting, but the actual mechanics of it are not terribly difficult. But there's a tremendous amount of refinement and nuance that can be brought to those basic gestures. For instance, I think it's really important for conductors, especially if you're starting, to conduct straight lines rather than loops or U's. Talking about in metrical music more than, say, a Gregorian chant or where you're maybe using chironomy, um, which is more fluid looking. But in terms of conducting metrical music, the most important basis is straight line conducting, to which, again, I add a lot of nuance over time and with some instruction. But if you can get that much going and you're already able to measure the, the time factor accurately in your gesture, I think you've gone a long way in the the basics of conducting. You know, for instance, if you've got a legato pattern um, and you're just conducting in two and you're conducting with your right arm and you go from one to the end of one as you go out from the bottom of the beat and you go in, in toward your own right at an angle for that first beat in the in the two four bar or two two bar, you make sure that your descent is exactly the same amount of time as your ascent. We don't think about that a lot in conducting. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, we're not just showing the beat. We're also showing the time between the beats. And so there's a natural place where your, where your hand goes away and then it starts coming back in. The standard legato technique is that they would be equal. Well, then something different must happen when it's more marcato or staccato. And that's exactly what conducting technique entails is understanding when and how to, to make those changes. But if you can get a, a basic legato pattern going with straight lines where the ascent and the descent of your hand is equal, I think you've gone a long way to getting the basics of conducting down. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so obviously you alluded to this, but some directors are loath to get away from the keyboard. Um, they feel more comfortable behind the keyboard. And so what are some tips you might give to someone who – is perhaps willing to get away from the keyboard, but there are certain points when they have to direct from the keyboard. Well, the first thing I would say is that the organ is kind of ingeniously designed to assist with this because you can play with your feet and sacrifice probably your left hand a little bit, right? And so 
I think that is an advantage. Um, if you can conduct from an organ where, you know, let's say you're playing a hymn and you need to conduct or something like that. There are ways to, and I've done this many times in places where I've had to conduct, um, to grab certain notes with your right hand that you should be playing with your left hand, a tenor note or something like that, that you can keep it going with just one hand and pedals and still conduct. I've done that many times. And sometimes it's really necessary to do that. You know, let's say you're playing a piece of repertoire that has organ involved. Or, or for instance, let's say you're doing a piece of Renaissance polyphony, but you're trying, you want to support it with a light organ accompaniment. Well, you, you certainly don't have to use this 16 foot in the pedal. You can use an eight foot and you can be looking at it as a simply you're providing a harmonic basis rather than literally playing every voice exactly where it's written. Sometimes that's enough to keep choirs um, in tune. Um, it's it's going to be equal temperament. It certainly won't be Renaissance style tuning, but it's still it's still a benefit and and it can still be edifying to the to the to the congregation, the faithful in their prayer. So I think that's the genius of the organ is that it allows a certain amount of liberty for your left hand. If you're playing at the piano, I think that's difficult. And I think the head becomes your your baton at, at, at a certain point if you're conducting from the piano. I remember being involved in an opera production one time, which I was having to be singing, and it was a piano production. And it was one of these uh, things in a park where there was a stage, but it was a very low frills kind of production and the conductor and the music director were the same person who was also the pianist and she was remarkable she was a fabulous pianist but she also was really good with eye contact she knew the score well enough that she could almost play it from memory and so she maintained eye contact and she cued us with all of her entrances just with her head the key to that was how well she knew the score and so that would be my second recommendation is that when you're going to be the conductor and the accompanist, it actually means you need to know the score better than the accompanist or the conductor would independently. So, yeah, that would be my. Yeah, that's a, gr <laughs> that's a great point. You know, I, I often think in that regard of that of famous video of Leonard Bernstein conducting with just his face <laughs> standing in oh, front yeah. of the group and mostly just moving his eyes and his eyebrows. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, eyebrow conducting. That's 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 very advanced, but it's it's very effective. And and I think, you know, I mean, a lot of conductors would say that the eyes are the most like we think about the arms and the hands. But the eyes in many ways are what conducts people, because what happens in conducting is an exchange of trust. I trust the singers, especially if there's no instrument involved and it's just you and their voices. That's all there is. That's the whole medium that there's you trust them to make the sounds we agreed that they would make in the rehearsal. And they trust you to know the score and to support and confirm the decisions that they're making as as performers. So you've got that role. And the freedom to make eye contact is the most essential way in which you can support those singers, because everybody who's performing in an ensemble is making a series of decisions. And one of the roles, because we all, it's, no, it's not like we don't have rehearsals. So we, we know what we're going to do. Why do we have a conductor after the rehearsal? Well, because that person confirms visually all of the decisions that we're making and that we've agreed to make prior to the to the performance. Right. That's the role of the conductor. Right. That reminds me of a story from when I was younger. I remember when I was quite young, one time going to a a wind band concert or something, and I, I asked my mom, "Mom, what is that person in front of the the instrumentalist doing? <laughs> what, <laughs> what what is the purpose of a uh, of this person? I I see them moving, and I, I I don't understand what the purpose is. And I think perhaps some of us uh, still kind of feel like that, especially if you know um, we're not finding ways to cultivate eye contact and the trust that you're you're talking about. Yeah, and I think you know. What emerged, why did conductors evolve into being? One of the reasons was a lack of mutual eye contact. So we all want to see while we're performing, which is, by the way, one of the big challenges. Uh, so our eyes correspond to sound. That's, that's really the critical thing in the performance of an ensemble work of any kind. Your eyes and your ears are in conformity. And that is one of the biggest challenges all of us are facing right now in the, the mitigation uh, measures that we're living under of 
trying to still do musical things without the confirmation of the eye and the ear at the same time, because there is a delay. I can see it even in my own computer that my lips are a little bit behind my my eyes and my ears. I mean, they're, they're not syncing. And so even though it's very close and, you know, the latency might be really very high tech, it's still not like it is when we're in the same room. And so when musicians could no longer make eye contact, that's one of the ways that one of the reasons that we, we developed the, the, the conductor. It also saves a little bit of time because if you're reading music while you're playing and which, for example, like Gregorian chant, you could say, well, wait a minute, there usually aren't enough people not to have eye contact. But with a conductor in Gregorian chant, that's a cross section of both the, the function that I'm reading at the same time I'm trying to have eye contact. If I'm reading, I need to see at least out of my peripheral vision, the conductor so that I have visual confirmation. Right. So there, so it's kind of like a, a substitute for eye contact. That's what a conductor always is in some way, shape or form. Right. So talking about the ear a little bit more, what have you found are the most helpful ways for your students to develop better ear training skills so they can hear more accurately in rehearsals? And perhaps also, you know, you're referring to our current time. Let's say that someone wants to improve their ear training, but doesn't have the benefit of being able to sing right now in a choral ensemble. What are some things they might do? Well, I think one of the most important things is to realize that we can't be isolated in our music making. And that means that, um, and you know, I can refer to that a little bit with, with respect to our current working situation. But for example, if I'm reading with a choir, I try desperately, desperately, desperately to avoid one part reading and learning the music at the same time, even if I have people that are non-readers in the choir. And the reason for that is that if you learn your part without learning the other part at the same time, at least as a reference pitch, you're, you're not really getting to the point where you're, where you're acquiring the piece. You need to learn it with the tuning in mind because it's very, very hard to improve it after the fact. So how do I develop myself individually when I'm not in the ensemble? And, and that is, is I actually really recommend, especially people maybe who aren't strong keyboardists. Like if you are a strong keyboardist, I would say on a regular basis, you should play a hymn, leave one voice out in the hymn and sing it in tune with that voice. And uh, so in other words, if there are four voices in the hymn, you leave one out and you sing the voice that you leave out in the keyboard. If you're not a pianist, I would say hold repeatedly, even if it ends up being a distant dissonance, hold the first note of the piece for a whole page and just play that that note while you sing the other notes of the piece because that that note by itself is probably either the tonic or the dominant of the piece depending on the, the period you're working in that having that reference pitch teaches you how to tune and so you're always listening to your voice your your pitch in relation to another that is the most important ensemble listening and ear development skill that I can point to. Um, there's a really, really good book called Choral Intonation by a Swedish author named Aldal. And I really recommend it because he talks about this approach of using reference pitches, either from the piano or whatever, whatever means you want. If you have just a, a pitch pipe on your iPhone or something like that, you can use that too. And to constantly have a reference pitch is one of the most useful ways to develop your ear. I would say that's even more important than the kind of classical ear training we do in conservatory settings where we teach people to, it's funny because like a lot of schools, they really emphasize dictation. So they'll, they'll do a lot of dictation in the ear training, but they won't do a whole lot of sight singing. And the reason for that is it's much easier to do dictation with a room full of 25 people than to have every one of those 25 people demonstrate <laughs> right. their voice to pitch acuity. And so they just leave that out in the training. And so we've missed something in the way we train musicians because of that. And so singing independently against a reference pitch, I think that's worth, that's golden. And, and it's something almost everybody can do on their own um, to develop. I think one of the worst things you can do if you really want to build a, a good ear choir a choir that's really concerned about listening carefully to the way they sing, the way they tune. One of the worst things are MIDI tracks of their part. In fact, when I've made MIDI tracks 
for my students, the one thing I don't have in that MIDI track is their part. <laughs> if it's an alto that I'm sending, and I did this with some of the things I've done online because of the coronavirus situation, I'll send a Bach chorale as an assignment to my choristers. And if they're an alto, they will hear the soprano part, the tenor part, and the bass part, and they must sing their part in relation to those other ones. And handily enough, on the software that I'm using, I'm able to generate my uh, reverence parts in, you know, mean tone, Pythagorean tuning, whatever tuning I want to, so that it doesn't end up being tuned like a piano, which of course is, yeah. you know, not great for choirs. So I think, I think that the idea of singing independently against a reference pitch is perhaps the biggest secret to choral intonation yeah. um, that's, that should be widely disseminated. One software thing that I've had actually good luck with is this program called Meludia. It has um, quite advanced levels in terms of ear training and recognition exercises. And so if someone is is you know in a situation where maybe they've been even singing a lot throughout the day and they want to do something that's just a listening activity, it seems like that software produces some of the most sophisticated listening exercises I've ever heard. I don't I don't know if you've ever heard of the the program or not. No, I haven't. I haven't uh, heard of that one. But I used to be an ear training and sight singing teacher, and so I did. I kept up more on the software possibilities. We used to use something called EarMaster, which was limited. But you know, it's been several years since I did that. There is a lot to be said for developing your inner ear as well, which is a little bit different than this reference pitch singing that I'm talking about. They're they're almost like different muscles in our hearing mechanism. And I think you know, for instance making sure that the choir gets used to not singing the note and hearing the note before they sing it. So I think that one of the challenges, of course, is that, you know, the other side of your ear besides the singing ear is the internal ear, the ability to audiate, to imagine before you make the sound. It's a little bit like imagining in your mind's eye, the, the Eiffel Tower. Can you see the Eiffel Tower in your mind? You may be able to sort of have an image of it, but do you have exactly the right number of cross beams? <laughs> that, that level of detail is really a gift if you can imagine absolutely every detail in that. And the same thing is true in music. You know, can you imagine a middle C in your mind's ear before you try to sing it? You can actually get better and better at that. It's something that you can work on. And I also I encourage that in my students as well. But this idea of developing the internal ear, the software, like you mentioned, of a Melodia, I think those are really an important part of it. And even choir directors, I would encourage you to get to a cadence and then wait just a little longer than maybe you usually do and then have the choir sing the next chord after imagining it and audiating it, just like they would visualize taking a step with their eyes closed imagine singing and hearing without hearing the pitch in immediate relationship to what went before this kind of tonal memory extending that as far as we can it's actually a practice and you can build it into your your modus operandi as a choir director on a regular basis and it helps them to develop acuity listening is the main skill that we do when we sing that's really critical right and the two types of hearing that you're referring to are also the two types of of hearing that you really do as a conductor, that if you're in a situation where you have to sing with the ensemble, your hearing is different from if you're just conducting. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's a little compromised if you're singing uh, because exactly. you invariably will be paying more attention to the part you're singing than the ones that you're not singing. And you just hear it differently. Also balance, things like that go off. And so ideally the conductor is, is silent <laughs> as a rule. But, you know, in our work environments, that is not always possible. And that's true, I think, you know, in, in many church situations. I know that there are plenty of times when I've had to sing along with my university tenors <laughs> under, you know, more adverse conditions. But I think that learning how to listen as a conductor is an acquired skill. I mean, I used to have a conducting teacher who said, like, who would say, listen, really, just close your eyes and just only hear the tones, only allow the tones into your consciousness. And I'll tell you, it's really hard work. It's really, really hard work at first, but you can grow in that and you can develop your oral acuity. And I would encourage you to do that when you're listening to music. Listen and really, really practice hearing every tone, hear every sound and all of the sounds, not just, not just one part, but hear every tone and all the tones. That's a, like really decide to do it. 
and your ear will will get more acute. You'll register more detail over time. Right. So you're offering a class online through St. Joseph Seminary this summer called Conducting and Group Vocal Pedagogy for the Parish Music Director. It's a three-day intensive from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. July 29th to 31st. So what might music directors expect in your class this summer at Dunwoody, especially as it will be online? How does one even go about teaching, conducting, and group vocal pedagogy on the internet? Well, it's actually been it's been a big part of the last month and a half in my own work at the university. And so I've had a little bit of trial and error on this. I find, for instance, and one of the things that I think we need to work into a course like this is a certain measure of asynchronous video graphic work with real time. That needs to be blended in conducting because... It's important, for instance, you know, one one of the things I plan to do is kind of a pre-lecture on the conducting problem, whatever that may be, whether it's how do you start the choir once you've stopped them at a fermata or a breath or a rest or whatever the case may be. So starting and stopping is a really important concept in our gesture and how we relate our gesture to starting and stopping. So to actually focus on this and then look at various problems like stopping on beat two starting on beat three, stopping on beat one, starting on beat two, stopping on beat one and starting on beat four. Now that's a little bit different kind of problem. So we have to kind of come up with kind of a, a menu of conducting problems that we we want to work on. And then how do I get the participants in the class to demonstrate their digestion of these concepts? Well, one of the things that we'll do is after we have kind of a pre-lecture and a discussion about the details of the technical approach is to say, okay, you, you have an hour <laughs> and I want you to go and record these exercises. And then what we're going to do is we're going to view them as a group and just sort of respond to what we're seeing, what we can do the next time to make those gestures more effective, have more impact and influence on supporting our singers. That's what all of it's about. And so that that will be the standard format uh, on the side of, of conducting because that really has been the biggest challenge for me in my own studio at the university this semester because I find real-time conducting is tricky because if I have a student on the video that is conducting and I'm supposed to make a sound, it won't sync. If that student, say, says the text or sings the text while they're conducting, it will sync on that person's end, but I can't have any experience with that person simultaneously. So the simultaneity is a real challenge. Of course, that's been the real challenge with any attempts to make music through our 4G world or whatever level we're on right now. Maybe 5G holds promises of improvement on that, but um, right now it's just not quick enough to, to be real-time effective. Um, and I've tried a few different platforms, even even ones that have suggested that that's their specialty and it still doesn't quite cut the mustard. But I do think that that will be the basis. So we'll do pre-lecture, technical discussion, individual practice time that is recorded and videographed, and then response sessions where we talk about improving what we're seeing in the videos. That I think is really going to be the cycle of feedback that I think will help people grow. And it also maybe it offers opportunities to people who might not be able to come in person um, exactly. to something like yeah. this. So it, it does have certain advantages. And so what we're trying to do is tool the course in such a way that we, we make the most out of those advantages and we overcome the obvious shortcomings, which can be, can be overcome with a strategy where we take the time to record then do feedback. I think that's really going to be the cycle. Right. So, what are some solutions you see to the current crisis vis-a-vis -vis music making and specifically choral singing? How might parish music directors think creatively about making it through our situation? You know, in a certain sense, there are so many voices that we are hearing in the world that, that they don't all concur. I mean, there are lots of voices out there about what the right thing might be to do. And I think that the, at the end of the day, at the end of today, um, at least, um, May 7th, we don't have enough data to make a whole lot of decisions about things like movie theaters, concerts, choirs, 
you know, those kinds of things are still, it's a different environment. It's a different set of set of social circumstances. So maybe we don't have enough information to really make a reliable recommendation. But what I can say is that at a certain point, you know, no disease has lasted forever. um, And this one probably will follow that pattern. There will be an attenuation of the severity at some point, maybe sooner, maybe later, we don't know. But at that point, there may be a a gradual easing into our ability to be together and make music together. I certainly hope it's sooner than later. I think it's important for the world. I think it's important for us as as artists and as musicians to have that opportunity. Obviously, not everyone will be in a position where they can take the same risks. And I think that's something that everyone has to take into account for themselves. But once we do have that opportunity to start to come together, perhaps there are going to be limitations on closeness. And so I think what the mitigating factors for choir directors are going to be things like space. How much space do I have to use for an ensemble? I need to preserve a certain foot distance between singers. That means maybe I need to have my choir on a rotation where we don't have tutti choir every time we sing, but we have um, the opportunity for for a slightly different ensemble over a series of weeks in which the, uh, you know, I imagine in this situation that the tenors will remain busy (laughs) just because of the demographics. (laughs) But, you know, it may be more infrequent for the sopranos and and so forth and the basses. But I think that there could be ways, if you have a choir of 20, you may, let's let's say the ideal is you have a choir of 20, five on a part, (laughs) and they're all of equal ability. Um, Let's just pretend that is a real thing. Uh, for a second. In in this scenario, (laughs) what you might be looking at is you really then have five choirs. Are there advantages? Well, you might send some kind of rehearsal materials to those individuals that are going to be different. And so maybe you're going to have a broader repertoire that you can perform live and in person, but with fewer people at a time. You may have to be thinking about the kind of repertoire that you're going to do under those circumstances. Have you tried singing in a situation where you're six feet away from the other instruments, it's pretty weird to be that far away and try to make ensemble music. It doesn't quite feel right. I think if you are in a situation where the acoustic is live enough, it might be very comfortable. And if you can hear well enough, it could be very comfortable. But I think even your own individual environment is going to mitigate those those kinds of decisions. I know I talked to some of the singers from the National Shrine in Washington, which has been, have basically been following pretty much this model. You'll notice that it's it's a slightly different ensemble every week if you look at their Sunday masses. Um, and so they're rotating through the choir, which I think is a noble thing that they're continuing to employ those musicians. I think that's great. But I've talked to some of them. They said, look, it's a real adjustment and, you know, they're professional singers and they sing in that they've been singing in that place for a long time. It's a real adjustment to be singing six feet apart. It really, really feels weird. So the kind of repertoire you might choose, the organ, for instance, may be that ensemble glue because it is a kind of voice that occupies a big foot space. And so perhaps music with organ, even doing plain song with a light organ accompaniment um, right. might even be uh, the best route forward in these limited situations. And of course, there are some mass ordinaries, for example, with organ and one voice written in the earlier 20th century or late 20th century that are quite lovely that might make for beautiful opportunities for music making, even if you only have maybe one or two singers of a cantor. There are more sophisticated things that can be done yeah. than just the standards sort of repertoire that's in in a lot of hymnals. Sure. And I mean, I think Healy Willen has a mass for organ in just one part, and it's lovely. And I mean, that could also be something that you could do on a sectional basis. So you could have all the sopranos. Uh, It depends on the range, of course. But, you know, there are different things that you could do to reconfigure your choir into a set of different ensembles. It's not ideal. And of course, there will be there will be difficult challenges with that. But I really, really believe it's important for us to like, you know, I mean, look, what we've done with our liturgical experience in the last eight weeks has been surreal. Like, It really has been surreal. And it is like truly because it isn't real. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why it is surreal. And we haven't really been to mass if we've watched a live stream. We're not morally present. We don't have any of the 
it's not it's it's an artificial experience well and and to be fair it is also a cultivation of an interior experience right and so you could approach it in the same way that you, we were just talking about listening that if you're a cultivating interior listening that there's an act here that in god's mystery and providence that we can cultivate that interior participation in a particular way absolutely and i think that may be one of the spiritual advantages. I mean, I felt it strangely, even my own self, I felt a little kind of different intensity in that aspect of my engagement with the liturgy and, and prayerfulness is that there is this kind of, you know, I certainly don't think it's good that we've been sort of de-incarnated as a church. We're, we're atomized as a church in this way. I don't think that's certainly not great for us in any way, spiritually or otherwise, but you're right. We do have access to uniting ourselves with the mass at a distance. That is, I mean, and of course, the tradition of spiritual communion that points that up. But I do think that what I think is remarkable that has come out of this is the degree to which, you know, we could have all said, look, we're going to have one live stream mass for the whole planet and we would all just log on to that one. But that's not what happened. People like local parishes have decided to live stream their masses, even though it's technically not terribly necessary in a, in a practical way, maybe even impractical to do it. But they're doing it because we're natively connected to place as human beings. So I think that is one of the things that I think has grown out of this. And that's why I think when the time comes to get back into parish life, into the life of the liturgy, even with, you know, attendance caps or whatever the case may be, spacing limitations, we must do as much as we possibly can. Because if we allow the erosion of our connection to place to happen, I, I really think there are really detrimental effects so, socially, spiritually. This atomization could really have bad spiritual results for the church. On the other hand, I think what this whole experience will do is have a, a profound realization of what Christ's incarnation means. Um, right. And in a way, this whole thing has been a catechesis on the way that Christ transformed the world through the incarnation. Place now matters in a way that it never did before the incarnation, that it's 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 all new and you have to be there. <laughs> and bodies matter in a way. Bodies you know, matter, I was, yeah. I was profoundly moved thinking about the readings on Low Sunday, the Sunday at the end of the octave of Easter, this appearance of Christ in the locked room, and he breathes on them. That was really a profound and moving image for me that, you know, we are all kind of in our own locked rooms. Yes. And this idea of being breathed on right now, is, <laughs> you know, if, if it were just anyone, it's horrifying. But, you know, it's our Lord and that it's in our Lord's breath that he assures us of his mercy and forgiveness and presence. And um, I think, you know, musicians seem particularly adept at thinking through a situation like this. Like we have innately creative brains and that's a, a gift that we offer to the world, I think, artists. And if you can pair creativity with good sacramental theology and a desire out of zeal for love of others and love of God, that's the sort of combination that musicians really have to offer the church at this time. Yeah, I think so. I, I agree with you completely. It really is going to be, um, we're all kind of trying to pull together the threads of what little we know about, you know, the, the, the coronavirus, about the way it's going to go through the world. But we're all going to have to kind of come up with solutions because as a species, we will go on with God's help. And I think, you know, this too shall pass. It was on a so I was driving um, on one of my errands for necessities. There was a coffee shop and they have a little sign on the front. They like to post little things. And that's what they posted. This too shall pass. And I think that's something we have to really embrace in this hyper into uh, this hyper isolation that we're going through at this point, that it's going to come to an end. And that, you know, I don't know what will become of airlines. I don't know what will become of oil companies. I don't know what will become of so many of these things. But I do know what will become of art. It's going to keep happening because God gave us Mozart, God gave us Bach, God gave us Palestrina, God gave us the chant. Because of that, it will go on. And I think that is an absolute survivability of that kernel of the human spirit, which is really, it is the fruits of God's grace to have given us this. 
treasure of music. It's a gift, and it's it's a gift that's going to keep renewing itself despite these kinds of challenges. And, and so I, I'm optimistic. I, it's not going to be easy. But I, I had a conductor friend who wrote to me after all of the in, in initial period of isolation began, what will become of the arts? And I said, well, I think the arts are going to be fine. The, the other things is what I'm worried about, <laughs> because I really do think that the existence of this great music, this treasure of music that we have, and then our innate, as you said, our urge to create, those things don't go away, even though every other economic structure, every other construct that you can imagine might be feeble and dated. That doesn't ever get dated. Musicians of the church are going to be a great consolation, I think, to our our brethren. And I think we should look at our role that way and to strive as best we can to overcome when the time comes. Thank you so much, Tim. I, I hope that our conversation today is, it's certainly helped me think through some interesting things and you've presented so many helpful and interesting ideas, but I hope that it's also really an encouragement to our listeners to trust in God's providence and walk forward even in the darkness of this time. Indeed. We'll put up a link about how to register for Tim's class this summer at St. Joseph Seminary in our show notes page. And until our next episode, may we sing the praise of his glory. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Heck Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole, from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is the first movement of Trio Sonata No. 6 in G Major by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Peter Carter. We look forward to having you join us next time, and until then, may we sing the praise of His glory. <laughs>